And here is part two of day 705. So that so-called coalition of the allies of Ukraine, they actually have to go through transformational changes and ideological changes. From initial Macron statement that Russia should not be completely upset with their defeat to about a 180 degree turn from that at large. And Europe turns out to be not ready with the risks of invasion as they start to realize that these risks exist in the window of three to five years. And their intel services are already talking about that in the public space. I think three to five years, that's very wishful thinking. One and a half to two, that I would believe. And yeah, they're somewhat changing, but they're still not really measuring things right. There was a discussion in Davos, and there was an offer for Russia from the Tribune. One of the uh, suggestions basically sounded like this. So, Russians, or citizens of Russia. Dear Russians, we will arrest 300 billion of your money. You will withdraw your troops to the borders of 23rd of February, or perhaps withdraw from the borders of Ukraine completely, from Ukraine territory, and we'll consider what to do with you after that. Do you think this offer is acceptable for Putin or other Russians after 350,000 losses that they already incurred? Well, given that European Union is very doubtfully will arrest any of the Russian assets on their territory, United States, Canada, Japan, countries of EU indeed have frozen 350 billions of Russian assets, but it appears to be doubtful that they will find a way to effectively use that lever because the countries do not have a common agreement or common vision on how to do that. So basically, as long as there is no consensus, as long as Russia knows that it can influence this consensus between these countries, Russia probably will not believe that threat, which implies that EU and US are capable not only to arrest uh, these assets, but also to deliver them to Ukraine. Russia, Nikolai, is in a very specific position right now. First one is that we are being presented with Putin and Russians as the Russian deep state, as the cold-blooded monsters who've calculated everything back in 1895, how they will crumble Europe and uh, they're cold-bloodedly implementing this plan. But I want to remind that Putin is still following recommendations of International Monetary Fund, for the economy, and Grev is the director of his Sberbank, one of the biggest banks in Russia. So they do have a rather liberal streak among the country, and they're occupying government positions as well. And of course, they also have their traditional patriots who are saying that, no, let's uh, dump all these liberals and let's talk with the West the way it deserves to be talked to. And liberals are actually still strong. They're communicating that, no, we need to find ways to come to agreements with the West somehow, maybe from the position of force, right, but still. And Putin himself started his career from rather pro-Western positions. And I will give you a simple example here. Our propaganda loves to say that in Russia, 400 people were jailed for the posts in Facebook. So you can read some materials from BBC. Ukraine jailed 200 people. Um, at least uh, they uh, started uh, criminal prosecutions, only twice less than in Russia. In Britain, they actually jailed 3,300 for different posts in social media for the same time frame. So, yeah, almost 10 times more. So, I'm, I understand the use of propaganda, but we should not be believing propaganda just blindly, right? It's for other purposes. It's for them so that they believe certain things. So, Russia is not, however sadly it sounds, is not really conducting a full-scale war. From the point of view of the West, uh, Russia is not. For Ukrainians, yeah, they're using everything they can use on us, everything they have in their military. So for us, uh, they're definitely engaged in a full-scale war. But for the West, they're not fully fighting. They're still following some recommendations of the West. So if Russia ripens in a way that this uh, Dugin traditional patriotic line prevails and they will start cleaning the house of liberals 
and standing on a course of direct confrontation with the West. And they will, as, as they say, publish the decree of Russian civilization. And they will announce that Russia is the civilizational state and saying, yeah, now it's the Russian world and everything is different. That's when the real war with the West will start. And it doesn't have to be conducted only with the military might, it will be also conducted uh, with different measures. And still they're fighting. Uh, they're fighting internally and a lot of Russian traditionalists are fighting with the liberal streak in the government and in society so that there is not a sign of West liberal values there. The West still has levers to change the situation in Russia through that liberal wing. They can have a channel to communicate with Putin's government and to negotiate. But if they get rid of the liberal part of uh, their structure, then they will be actually fighting for real with the West as well. And there is a competition of two charts happening right now, essentially. Per Dugin, how soon will Putin publish that degree of Russian separate civilization and will start cleansing its house from liberals? Or how quickly will the West understand that there should not be any market in security and they will start banishing market for military production and military industrial complex? And for Russia, it's difficult to do that, uh, to grow the chart because they still have some liberalism and for the West it's difficult as well because they are liberal. But uh, here is the thing, in Europe there is a right turn, very prominent, and Putin is now uh, running the next round of his elections because uh, he served his current six years and now there is another election in April. So I do have a supposition that after he will be re-elected and nobody I think believes that he will not be, they might start the process of cleansing and purging down the liberals. And they might announce that decree about restart of the empire, essentially. And if that happens, then the end of winter and spring of this year will be much less uh, happy for the West and, of course, for us as well. No, it doesn't mean that Russian troops all of a sudden will get a capacity to take Avdivka in a month instead of half a year. But there are other angles that Russia can affect the West at. So the question is whether there will be a new effort to purge the remnants of liberalism from Russian establishment. And how soon will the West understand that they are severely not on par with the proper speed of preparing for this conflict? And they need to banish some elements of market from their military preparedness and uh, re-amp it in a different fashion. All right. In order to support the hypothesis you're talking about right now, what Putin is betting on, that's how I interpret your words about the military elites and the liberals in Russia. Look, he allowed for that nude party recently to happen and they based a new revival on this conflict, pointing at new elites saying that we need new elites, not these ones with naked butts who are partying at the art event, but um, the new ones who are more patriotic and pro-Russian. And he is also limiting the purchasing of drugs and medicines and um, equipment for the socially needy parts of society. So essentially the signal we see is that he is diminishing certain support in favor of a new course. And we can only see tra trace that by the commentary of the distributors of those uh, medicines in Russia, that the purchasing is dwindling. So Russia has to take certain actions in order to, and I mean Putin's Russia, his government, to concentrate the effort on the military production, military rhetoric and military elites. We have all that, we have the war with the West and it's all Russian out war and nothing else matters. And uh, we only need to have one central elite and all these previous elites with uh, naked butts and the others who ran away from the country. We don't need them. And also people who are now in hospitals who, of course, will be of no use on the front. We don't need them, so we can bring them on the altar of this war. 
There is also another news coming from Russia, Nikolai, um, that there are a lot of men over 40 in hospitals treating their chronic diseases to make sure that they're eligible for the draft. Because army is prestige, it's money, and it allows them to get to the new social level if they get all the payments right. So I'm impressed by the number of people who are still willing to get drafted, to get conscripted, to sign a contract. Even in Ukraine, where you have to capture guys out in the street, and in Russia at the same time, there are people trying to fix their chronic diseases to make sure that they can sign the contract with military. This is a very not good story for the West and a bad story for Ukraine as well. For these goals, they will, of course, suffer through shortage of medicines, and in Russia, they do have anti-war trends as well. And uh, currently, they have a focal point in the new presidential candidate, Nadezhdin. He is not that much of a political liberal himself, but uh, he has become an alternative to Putin. And there is that Russia too. And, you know, they may let him go and into elections, and perhaps he can even score 20-25%. But... In the meantime, they still have enough people willing to sign contract and who are doing a lot to make sure they can sign this contract. Right, Alexei, it tells us that the Russian war machine at least has warmed up and uh, people who are going to fill the mobilization reserve, they have enough. They provide enough numbers. Yeah, we do have illusion, Nikolai, that people are saying that Russians do not understand that this is war, that they are risking their lives here. They do understand. They know that they have very high losses. They generally understand that for one killed, we have on the Ukrainian side six wounded who come back to fight. And on their side, it's one for one. And it's for different reasons, but their medical service is horrible. It's very difficult for them to evacuate the wounded. So knowing all that, they are still going and signing contracts. This is what Ukraine and the West need to understand and start thinking on. Because people who sign contract, they know that if they get wounded, they likely will die because of lack of medical aid and uh, the current death to wounded ratio. These people will tolerate absence of other medicine in Russia. Just like we were laughing at them having shortages of eggs and other products, you know, they survived and uh, the eggs eventually appeared on the shelves again. So they'll be, of course, screams about, yeah, let's do people's medicine, let's do herbal healings and all, but they will fare. It reminds me of that story about the Crimean bridge that Russia was building. We in Ukraine was were laughing about that, saying that it's impossible, it's a very difficult engineering feat, that they'll just waste money and nothing will happen. And the Chinese maybe will build it for them and the first flood will wash the bridge away. Well, it's still there. And how long can we be delusional? I mean, delusions, they can exist forever, but we cannot be trusting all these delusions. It's the realists that win worse, not the fantasy players. All right, so about circumventing the, san the sanctions, Russia also still does not have serious issues with semiconductors. Most of semiconductors used in Russia are still manufactured by American companies, and Bloomberg writes that in 23, Russia, for the most part, was importing chips manufactured in EU and United States and re-exporting them from third parties, third countries, avoiding the sanctions, direct sanctions. And these are not medicine. These are expensive, small-scale commodity that uh, helps them to build their military nomenclature. All right, let's go back to Britain, another important piece of news from there. British citizens need to be trained and equipped to partake in a possible war with Russia, says Patrick Sanders, British general, the head of their general command, as far as I understand. Oh, he is retiring, and that's his uh, farewell statement. Yeah, he's the head of the committee of the uh, generals of staff. So, in his statement, Given on the Armored Equipment, Armored Vehicle Conference, he said that British Army needs to grow their numbers to 120,000 people in uh, the time frame of four years compared to the current 74,000. 
these small numbers I wanted to ask you, Alexei, about Britain. You know them pretty well, right? I, as far as I remember, you actually even got trained in some of the British military schools. So tell us how important that is, how principally important that is, if during three years they managed to inflate their military from 74 to 130. So this number, Nikolai, is about their infantry, their ground troops. They'll be a third to maybe 40% more powerful than what they are now. With these 120 new totals, what tasks do you think they'll be solving, right? In Ukraine, we currently have about 600,000. What uh, fighting on the front? What if 120,000 come here? You know, that may change something, but they'll probably keep something over in Britain because they still need to keep other positions, maybe Baltic countries, perhaps aid in a different conflict like Taiwan or something. So they likely will be sending expeditionary corps here and there. My problem with them is that they are preparing for a different war. They're preparing for smaller size operations. Mass warfare is done under different rules. And for the last 30 years that they've been preparing for smaller size operations, that is not a match for the current scale. And Brits seem to start understanding that they need to create mobilization reserve, they need to train their servicemen en masse and uh, draft them and have capacity to do this. so. Um, I think Poles are deriving a better lesson from the situation. They're very close to Ukraine, so it's easier for them to get it. But Europeans at large are still at the illusion that we'll revive our productivity and our small, well-equipped armies will absolutely destroy that Russian herd that is poorly equipped. Well, in reality, they can perhaps launch 10,000 Tomahawks on the first day and destroy maybe all airfields, all warehouses, and a lot of military production capability. After which Russia will probably use population anger, another 300,000 uh, recruits will be added to the fold. They'll be given maybe World War I rifle and they'll be sent to fight. But for each of these infantrymen, you cannot use a tomahawk. So you'll need to fight them in the trench from 5 to 20 yards. And behind them, there'll probably be a big flock of UAVs flying. And this is the war that Europeans are not ready for. They, I don't see them putting 300,000 troops to fight in the trenches in mud on the pistol distances. And given that Russia has this resource and they still have nuclear umbrella and they're part of the axis of evil, so if they really will ask, they might get additional aid from Korea, China and Iran. So Russia fills itself rather comfortably and they probably will be conversing with the West if not from position of power, but from position of, guys, give it another thought. Do you really want that conflict? And in parallel to a trend, let's uh, duke it out with Russia, there will be another trend in Europe that will be considering perhaps to help with this war and will figure it out monetarily. So these two trends will be fighting. On one hand, there'll be Orban and the likes. On the other side, there'll be the Atlantic side, which uh, the Atlantic group, which will be saying, let's fight. And the destiny of Ukraine depends directly upon which group prevails. Right? Can we influence that? Not really. We, we're trying. We're doing our best. Can we really make sure that it goes one way or the other? No, we don't have these mechanisms. And since 1991, the West did declare the end of history, the end of times, so we gladly listened to them and sold most of our military equipment, unfortunately. And now we are dependent on those superpowers of Hungary and Slovakia and their decisions to allow support for Ukraine or not to. And our destiny as a country, as people, depends upon European decisions. And I'm afraid they might make a decision not in our favor. And I know friends, I have a lot of friends here in Ukraine that are absolutely on the same bandwagon with me. We got to wake the West, we got to make sure they're with us. I'm totally with you. The way I'm waking them up and here, you don't even hear. 
because these things, when I was saying, you know, Ukraine may unite the forces with Putin and go against Europe, this is only one-tenth of things they used to wake them up. And before, we only had Fitzo and Orban who were going to strike truce with Putin. Now we finally have a different angle, a different group there that is also saying, okay, well, let's fight with Russia, if need be. So I guess our efforts bring some fruit. But it takes a lot to change it. And there is no assurances yet. And conscience is the one that defining the circumstance. So we're trying to change that. And we're screaming about the West. There need to be awoken. Have we woke up ourselves in Ukraine? Yeah, Alexei, I actually had a different stream today on my channel with uh, military officers who are telling that they're trying to organize the production of UAVs right there at the front. They even found private companies who can do some components for them so they can assemble it at the last minute on the front. They even got the grant and uh, started the production, but based upon the number of paperwork that is needed and permissions that needed, they cannot realize that in the proper quantities. Uh, Nikolai, we are still failing to set the real questions. This is the sign of being immature. When we're putting a question, who will be a new commander-in-chief, we are missing the right question. When can we stop the bureaucracy in military? And it doesn't matter which commander-in-chief will do that. But we're not putting the right questions, unfortunately. These questions are being posed by the right servicemen, by the officers who've been uh, on our streams and interviews for the last year. And they're poking at the right pain points. So when we start seeing their questions asked at a much higher level, that's when we'll say that we have a chance to change things. Until then, we are not awakened yet. And that's why I'm saying that the question about the West awakening is number two. The first question is about awakening Ukraine. When will that happen? Let's talk about the stats for UAVs. You did mention the flocks of UAVs that might be flying over the heads of Russian army that will be armed with uh, Maxim machine guns and Mossin's rifles. We can look at some trends as the result of two years of war. What do we have currently? We have three charts. The first one is FPV drone attacks on the infantry. Blue are Ukrainian, metrics and Russians are red. You see that at the beginning of this war, Russia was slacking. They were slacking till the end of 23. In the end of 23, they started catching up and they took over at the very end of it. And these strikes, I understand, are the ones that were verified by the national and international groups. So these are verified data. There are three charts. Let's bring the second one. These are FPV drone attacks on positions. Here you can definitely see the difference. In 23, Russia started using them as uh, the weapon in its own right, one of the key elements of their strategy and tactics on the front. We are trying to do some, but not really much. 210 against 30 tells a story. And the strikes of drones on the armored vehicles, here you can say that Ukrainian advantage still remains. Blue bars are definitely taller than the reds. But with all that, I'm still concerned with the trend. Even if we do believe that Ukrainian drones hit Russian equipment more often than Russian drones hit Ukrainian equipment, I see the two charts slowly coming together. And I see our strikes on their equipment going down as well since October of 23. So we either have fewer drones on the front or Russians are running out of their armored vehicles so we don't have targets. What do you think is happening? I think the differences in battle application. We can see the priorities. We're attacking their equipment. They're using drones to attack our positions. Basically, our task is to destroy their capability and their task is to take positions. And that's the difference in accents because by the total volume of drones usage were generally equal. But you can note that at the beginning of war, they were not even using them. So during the last two years, they created this branch 
they grew the numbers of production and they're actively using them. So Russia is learning from this war. We'll see what will be happening in a year, if we will have uh, something to talk about. In a year and half a year, right, we will have some things to talk about. So I think the difference is in priorities. And we're destroying their tank park. They basically destroyed all the armored vehicles that they started this war with. And they're continuing to refit and to build new ones. We continue to strike it out of the battlefield, and they in turn are using FPVs to storm our positions. So what are we using to storm their positions? This is the question of a global direction of a concentration of the use of this weapon as FPV drones. We still lack a lot of information, so probably at the end of the war when we can will be able to overall draw conclusions what was more successful, what was more reasonable to attack positions or to attack equipment. But I can suggest an ideal solution. We need to have enough drones to attack both positions and equipment. And this question should be posed not to me, but to the leaders of our military manufacturing. Right, uh, on our streams we do continue to support personal collections and fundraisers of our troops. Under this video, there is a 53rd Brigade on the FDFK direction, continuing their fundraiser. Right now, they are collecting money for radio electronic fight, and it's only 100,000 hymnas left to raise. We probably will close it soon, and we'll post a different one under the stream. And the next one will be for the guys who are fighting near Klishivka and Andreevka. The enemy is attempting some offensive maneuvers, and they also need UAVs. They're actually just asking for one UAV for 85,000 hryvnias. So this will be a quick fundraiser and we'll put a different one after. They just need to buy this one before Tuesday because that's when they will be moving out to the front. And the situation is very hot there. So all these links are under this video. Please uh, remember we are not touching the monies. They go directly to their bank accounts. We just verify that these are legit army units that are requesting aid, and um, this is all that we do. This is our role in this process. All right, Alexei, this part that we have left, maybe 15 minutes, let's dedicate to probably what's unfolding in the Middle East and uh, the conflict that is going on with China and an important element that American base was hit recently. The world is expecting an answer. What do you think will be an adequate answer to that attack? During the last month and a half, there were over 150 strikes on American bases. So if you divide it, basically two attacks per day on American targets. And before then, we only had wounded Americans as a result of these attacks. Now there are several dead. And up until now, United States were avoiding this conflict. Once again, Iran will be more difficult proposition to fight with than Iraq, and even Iraq was a rather expensive war to fight. So Iran right now is sponsoring essentially four different military campaigns around itself, and Hussites is one of them. So Biden did declare that Iran will get repercussions, but we are not seeing direct attack on Iran yet. I strongly suspect that Biden administration will hit something in Yemen, something in Syria, or somewhere else. Uh, the question is if both sides will escalate this conflict. But it does appear that they don't want to do it. As long as they were wounded, Americans did not want to retaliate properly. Now there are some dead servicemen, we'll see what will happen. But I think they are seriously concerned about opening another war, and uh, maybe another war that they cannot win. So it depends on Iran, if Iran wants to raid, to raise stakes in this conflict. And we understand that every added war, number three, number four, number five, this is adding to the scale of catastrophe for United States and its allies because they're physically running out of resources. If you remember those 50,000 shells that were moved between Ukraine and Israel, and just for reference, this is for half a day of active warfare here on the Ukrainian front. So if this is a problem, then 
they probably will have more issues fighting the axis of evil at large. And if you'll be coping with three wars, they may throw war number four, five or six at you. And that's it. And there is no clear answer what comes next. And they do have a lot of issues within the United States as well that they are con concerned with. So the big question, what would be considered an adequate answer from the United States to the death of three servicemen on the base? What strike do they need to conduct in order for that to be considered a strong response? Well, look, the war is not about body count. It is not about retaliating and killing three or 33 in return and response. The question is in strategy. These things need to be done strategically, not as an answer, you killed several of us, we'll kill several of you. Israel has its strategy. They're killing Iranian servicemen in Syria to prevent additional aid coming to Hezbollah. Or perhaps they're catching people who are responsible for the terrorist acts against Israel. What is the global strategy for the United States? Oh, that's unclear. Right. Biden administration doesn't have a strategy against Iran, so any answer will be inadequate until the strategy is developed. And if you had a strategy, perhaps you wouldn't even need to answer. It's a very thin and precise thing, because it's like a comparison of a chess player with a diplomat. Chess player is thinking how to win, and diplomat is thinking whether to win or lose. And there's no strategy. They announced the existence of axis of evil. They paraded on the white horse, but there is no strategy to respond to that threat. And the response can be measurable, right, with the attack. They can definitely kill three or 30 or 300 or 3,000 of Iranian troops. But what will happen next if both sides are diligently avoiding escalation? Well, actually, if Iran will stop avoiding escalation, then Biden administration will be in a deep problem because they'll have to split their resources in three directions then. And I think then we will not be able to see any voting for aid for Ukraine for another number of months. All right, now an important question that probably stems from your answer. Having spent enough time in the West at large and in the United States in discussions about American strategies, did you come to any agreement or understanding what that strategy can be for the United States? They do not have a strategy right now, Nikolai. They have a struggle between isolationists and the globalists, and globalists have nothing to offer. Isolationists are saying, well, you failed Afghanistan and Iraq, what can you do next? You'll fail the next war as well, and you probably made money on the corruption, plus you're sending illegal migrants to the country or allowing them to come. And the globalists are attacking isolationists, mostly it's Republicans on that side. They're saying that your idea to build a shining city on the hill is somewhat akin to trying to be born backwards. You cannot be reborn again from your mother, so we are what we are. We need to address global challenges. And uh, what you guys are trying to build is impossible. And there are also allies of the third path Guys like Musk who are saying, well, to hell with you all, let's de-explore the space. So problem is that probably none of them is fully right, but the globalists are wrong more. All the instruments of global influence that they built are subpar. And in the last 30 years, they don't really have successes to boast. They only have catastrophes. But the isolationists, the ones who are trying to build the shining city on the Capitol Hill, well, can also not achieve that goal because in order to achieve such a goal you need a good army and a good fleet and very independent economy to support itself outside of the world at large and they don't have strategy they have conflict that is now growing into a big civilian conflict internally and they don't have solutions for the outside world this is our problem with them well okay but with this trump and his camp probably are making statement that they are still preparing a trade war with China. And the previous one did finish with coronavirus, at least. So remember that the two-year-long struggle between Trump's administration and Chinese government was acknowledged that China did lose in the trade. 
but China internally commented for their internal consumption that it was just the first time and we will win again, time will come. A few weeks later, coronavirus debacle happened and uh, the jury is still out if they are connected. Nikolai, let's ask another question. If, for example, Epidemic X, the one that they've allegedly be game playing in Devas, will follow another bout of trade sanctions with China, and they'll be 10 times more deadly than COVID. What will the West do? Because we do know that during COVID, all these countries, they shut down all the borders, sent each other to hell, and were diverting aid, first of all, to themselves and not to those who really needed that, like Italy at some point where the retirees were dying in droves. So if there'll be another virus that somehow leaves a laboratory in Wuhan, why I'm asking this question is that some people are saying that the excess of evil have no livers against the West. They do. Calium fertilizers that all the agriculture depends upon. They're owned predominantly by Russian Federation. And China also needs that. And some people are saying that Russia is a satellite of China. Well, no, they're not. If they cut that supply, China may be facing hunger rather soon. And they can also threaten the West with the same resource. So now there are some articles in press about the question, how come Russia has this geopolitical weapon in its hands? And um, recently RIA News published that Trump card in the hands of Russia, that Russian fertilizers still affect agricultural market in Europe at large. And they actually created this strength within Russia when they were fighting with the fertilizers from Belarus. That was one of the right, uh, Alexei. That was one of the reasons named why Belarus is not facing severe sanctions because they have calium fertilizers as well. All right, so they limited Belarus, and now they have to export them through Russia. And it, yeah, it basically reflects how short-sighted the Western politicians are. I would say the Western politics is really at probably the lowest point of its development. They're saying even more aggressive descriptors at each other. So I'm kind of being delicate here. But I do want to address our Ukrainian citizens that we should not be harboring any unicorn dreams about the position and the status of the West. All right, China is exerting some pressure on Iran so they would rein the attacks by Hussites in the Red Sea. So on the backdrop that Trump may reignite the big trade war with China again upon getting power in Washington, D.C., do you think it would mean more for China to keep the current status quo and perhaps bet on Biden instead? And perhaps help Biden by reigning in the problem in the Red Sea? I will see how they'll deal with the Hussites. I don't think the West can prevail with the airstrikes, really. Um, we'll see how it develops. But what do you think, Alexei? Who is more, who China is more interested in to be at the White House, at the White House in the United States? They don't really have anything to agree with. That's their problem. The globalists are probably a bit more interesting for them in general because they are continuously bowing down to China and suggesting that we split the world into two poles and we'll be living happily ever after. But this is not exactly the interesting offer for China because in order to create a bipolar world, you need to create some system that is in, of interest to at least half the world, just like Soviet Union did. They had their own ideology, they had their own programs, they actually won several wars during the Cold War on this ideology and the aid they were providing to different participants of their side. And for China, it's a different story. Even their immediate neighbors, like Koreans and Japanese, consider Chinese to be almost aliens from another planet. So this is the problem for China. They cannot really be playing that globalist game in that fashion. It's not about them. And as for Trump, He's uh, probably going to attack a Chinese manufacturer with, you know, 60% tariffs. He'll probably try to bring up the American manufacturer again, or at best, uh, European manufacturer as well. 
And it's a big question if China is going to aid Russia that is fighting this war. If China will start seriously supporting Russia, that would mean that uh, this war will become much more difficult for the West to wage and to participate in. I'm not even talking about Ukraine in this scenario. So for us, it is very important that China would not be going into the hot war themselves. But I'm afraid Trump may reignite that level of conflict, and I'm not sure how he will react. There are a lot of unknowns how he will react to that change in Chinese position. But uh, you should notice that with all these unknowns, there is definitely one subject missing from this equation, us, Ukraine. We don't have enough resources, enough real sovereignty to influence and to change these situations. So. Personally, I'm way more interested in uh, our processes internally. How can we grow to affect these global events? All right, I think this is an answer to that same question about the adulthood for Ukraine, right? That migrates from one stream to another. It is 9 p.m., 9, 11 p.m. in Kiev. Let's put ellipses on this stream and wait maybe for some news next week, and maybe we will get some signals by that time. How are we going to deal with our problems? How shall we try to acquire our subjectivity? Otherwise, we'll just have another reason to laugh, right? It's better than crying. Definitely, Nikolai will be laughing and smiling, even if it is an apocalypse. All right. What's important is to please continue helping Armed Forces of Ukraine. The link is under this video, 53rd Brigade. We're currently gathering funds for them for radio electronic warfare system. And we ask you to support them in any fashion you can and allow them to purchase what they're looking to get for them to be more effective in their position. Thank you, everybody who watched our stream. Do not forget to subscribe to Alexis' channels, to Alpha Media, and Telegram as well, and, of course, to the Privateer Station, if you are listening or watching that in English. Thank you, everybody. Have a quiet night. Good luck.